January 1943, French Morocco. President Roosevelt arrived for the important Casablanca conference. Prime Minister Churchill and the President were making far-reaching military decisions. With the combined chiefs of staff, they planned global operations. Generals Marshall and Arnold had to build up the United Kingdom base in the face of Nazi plans to infest the Atlantic with submarines. Remembering how their U-boats in 1917 had brought England to her knees, enemy leaders were proud of their 1943 plans for a network of sub-pens. Dr. Tote's engineers now built them with 12-foot concrete tops to make the U-boat nest safe from the Allies' heaviest bombs. The enemy had launched a monstrous U-boat program. 300 by 1942, 900 by 1944. This was to be ruthless undersea warfare, masterminded by Admiral Carl Dunitz. Back in the United States, our new fighters like the P-47s were being shipped to England. Fighter aircraft had become so vital in the war against the Axis, they were given high priorities. Because of the submarine menace, Allied navies escorted all convoys. By torpedoing the freighters, the enemy tried to cut our Lend-Lease lifeline. Killer subs roaming the North Atlantic in the first half of 1942 had sunk 506 Allied ships. Threatened was the security of Great Britain and our build-up for the air war in Europe. Victorious German submarines were organized in wolf packs. Confronted with this desperate emergency, the U.S. Navy called on the Army Air Forces to assist them in the fight. Our long-range depth bomb carrying B-24s were the answer. The ultimate workhorse of our counterattack on the U-boats was the radar-equipped Liberator. These land-based planes were matched against a sneaking killer. The enemy operated almost unimpeded along the vital shipping lanes. Plenty of good hunting. First for them, but after May 1943, for us. Most of us in the 1st Bomber Command and later in the 25 squadrons of the Anti-Submarine Command patrolled wide areas ahead of the convoys. On the deck, we searched immense stretches of the Atlantic hunting for Nazi periscopes. Crews crash dive. Our exploding bombs were clearing the North Atlantic of the Nazi U boat threat. In those summer months of 1943, the Anti Submarine Command of the Army Air Forces did a vital job. American fighter planes and badly needed supplies got through. But in the Far East, on another front, supplies were only trickling through. General Arnold and Allied brass faced the fact that General Chenault's 14th Air Force had to be supplied. Some of his bomber operations had almost ceased. Following Casablanca decisions, Arnold ordered General Bissell to help the ATC India-China wing increase the airlift over the Himalayas. We called it Flying the Hump. Here over Calcutta, India, we got an idea of how much our sky wagons were slated to carry. There was plenty. Tons of food and medicine. Tons of gasoline and bombs. Shiploads of them every day. Even this was only a fraction of what would come. First, while still crated, supplies moved overland by train due north about 800 miles. This was the slow part of the long journey. Then near the border of Tibet, our supplies were parceled out to several airfields, like Chabwa, largest of the hump terminals. Here too, although there was plenty of manpower, the transfer methods were primitive. Until more ordnance equipment arrived, the natives helped fight the war with their bare hands. Some of these bombs weighed half a ton. After a year of operation by the 10th Air Force, 
we had grown from a squadron of 10 borrowed transports to a fleet of 140 high altitude C-46s and 47s. By 1943, Hump Commander General Edward Alexander began to set records for troops, supplies and equipment being lifted over the hump. Stretching before us were 500 miles of rough duty. Before it was over, the treacherous hump had cost us 250 transports, 250 cargoes, and 800 airmen. A high price to pay for the privilege to fly over the highest mountains in the world. We flew continuously, some of the time through Jap fighters and treacherous weather. The clouds made pretty pictures, but at 20,000 feet they could mean ice and death. No emergency landing fields among saw-toothed five-mile-high peaks for us aerial truck drivers. Flying without fighter cover, it was always good to hear we were on the beam and minutes from landing at Kunming, China. In December of 1943, the India-China wing carried slightly over 6,000 tons. Before the war's end, ATC had airlifted more than one million tons of supplies and one million troops over the hump. With the help of Army Airways communication system, flights eventually averaged one plane every minute and a half. Peak airlift was reached in July 1945. 71,000 tons in one month, including a fleet of jeeps. Every four tons of gasoline delivered used three and a half tons to get them there. Despite the hazards and hardships, despite the costs, the Army Air Forces had conquered the hump. Up our way, in the dismal and dreary Aleutian Islands, off Alaska, it was a different sort of war. Around us was the deep, spongy tundra of dead grass and muck. Over us, fog, sleet, and rain for days on end. In spite of it, our 11th Air Force under General Bruce Butler not only protected Alaska from Jap advance, but also struck offensive blows at the enemy. We had a single fighter group of 100 planes, including P-38s. Our force was built around a handful of pilots experienced in Alaskan flying. Colonel Jack Chenault, son of the 14th Air Force commander, led a fighter squadron. Our strength at this time for the entire Alaska Aleutian area was only 226 operational planes. Luck was with us. On 8 April, the weather cleared and we set out to crush the nip thrust at Attu, most distant of the island chain. We also helped to box in Kiska, the second enemy held island, forcing the Japanese to withdraw. From flooded fields, we waded into the enemy. Our small air force was guarding the northern approach to America. In the Pacific, the word went out. General Nathan Twining and his crew were lost on a routine flight. We set up everything that could fly, but the South Pacific had thousands of miles of ocean. Chances of finding the commanding general of the 13th Air Force were slim. Then, on the morning of January 31st, five days and six nights after ditching, two rubber rafts were sighted. Now the question was, how many had survived exposure in the Coral Sea? The search plane radioed the base. Immediately, two Navy Catalina flying boats were ordered out to make contact with the search planes, which directed them to the rafts. After being fished out of the drink, the survivors were rushed back to the nearest base where medical aid awaited them. Although cramped for 130 hours in the small rafts with very little food and hardly any water, their morale stayed high thanks to General Twining. All 15 aboard the lost B-17 had survived a rugged experience. Twining and his crew were part of a small army of men whose lives had been saved by the air-sea rescue services of the Army and Navy. 
General Twining rejoined our theater commander, General Millard Harmon, in planning new operations up the Solomon Island chain. We had fresh B-24s, and in July, we were able to launch our 37-day campaign to Jap-held Munda Field on New Georgia Island. Some of us had taken off from Hard One Henderson Field on Guadalcanal, which American men had bought and paid for with their lives. The blow we were about to deliver to Munda, we hoped would make their sacrifices worthwhile. We were finally nearing the island. As soon as we made our approaches to Munda, jungle-hopping medium bombers went after the Jap Air Drum and its defenses. opened up. Stubbornly, the enemy held on until 171 aircraft dropped 145 tons of bombs in a half hour. It was the heaviest air bombardment yet cooked up in the South Pacific in one day. By the time resistance had ended, the enemy had lost 350 aircraft. In only nine days, the Allies rushed the strip into operating condition. P-40s were the first to land, followed by heavy bombers which could easily be carried on the coral runways. Warhawks helped protect the base as we rapidly built it into a key for the Solomon Islands. In a few weeks, traffic exceeded that of any field in the South Pacific reaching the peak of 564 aircraft in one day. The Munda campaign had shown the success of a new tactic, bypassing heavily defended enemy points and gaining air superiority behind them. General MacArthur described the island hopping campaign as a series of battles for airfields. In the South Pacific, as elsewhere in all global operations, the Allies had proved the might of air power. Air power had helped clear submarines from the Atlantic. Air power had conquered the hump. Air power had made Pacific Island hopping possible. Later chapters will show these daring tactics applied to smashing the Axis itself as more men and weapons were added to the mighty arsenal of the United States Air Force. June 1948, Berlin. Ever since the end of the war, three years before, tension had been increasing between the Allied military government and the Soviet bosses of East Berlin. The Cold War was becoming warm. Two and a half million people, more than half of Berlin's population, lived in the American, British, and French zones. But the whole city was surrounded by the Soviet zone of Germany. Supplying the two and a half million people of the western sectors was a system of rails, canals, and roads. Suddenly, the Soviet military government in Berlin clamped down a land blockade of the allied sectors of the city. The suspension of all traffic successfully blocked all surface access to the city. The Soviets claimed that technical difficulties caused the stoppage. The truth was that they were trying to force the Western Allies to surrender their position in Berlin. And the weapon was hunger. The occupation personnel of the Western nations, both military and civilian, along with the two and a half million of the German population, were threatened with starvation. What were they all going to do for food and fuel? With all the arteries into the city closed, Berlin was paralyzed. With the fuel supply cut off, there wasn't much electricity. Nearly all of the lights went out. The Allies made an important decision to hold Berlin. In late June 1948, General Curtis LeMay, commanding general of the U.S. Air Forces in Europe, started the airlift. Our all-out effort began on the 28th when we airlifted about 300 tons. From airfields like Rhine, Maine, near Frankfurt, 
we flew the air corridors through the Soviet zone to Tempelhof Field in Berlin. The airlift was our first important use of air power as an instrument of national policy, according to Secretary of the Air Force Symington and General Vandenberg, Chief of Staff. General Lucius Clay, our European Commander-in-Chief, joined in accepting the challenge. The call went out for cargo aircraft from all parts of the world, from the Caribbean, from Texas, Alaska, Hawaii, Panama, troop carrier squadron sent C-54s. And before long, Matz was sending them too. In the States, Westover was our jumping off place for airlift planes preparing to span the Atlantic. The Combined Airlift Task Force Headquarters was established at Wiesbaden. The entire operation was now in business in a big way. Army, Navy, and Air Force, working together, gave an inspiring example of joint action. And we mustn't forget that the British and the French gave much help. Headed by General William Tunner, who had been in charge of the aerial supply missions over the hump in Asia during World War II, the airlift task force was ready for a long haul, pouring supplies into Berlin and bringing out manufactured goods. Rhein-Main was the chief air gateway of the corridor to Berlin. The Army Transportation Corps moved supplies in from ports and railheads in 10-ton trailers, about the cargo capacity of a C-54. Coal from the Ruhr, flour from our Midwest, sugar from Cuba, coffee from Brazil, butter and milk from Denmark, and many other supplies from many other places. Berlin's minimum daily requirement was about 4,500 tons of supplies. For several months in 1949, our deliveries averaged more than 7,500 tons a day. The Air Force assigned more than 300 airplanes and more than 20,000 men to the airlift. And Britain made a large contribution of both aircraft and personnel. It was an operation without precedent and a severe test of precision flying, of logistics, maintenance, communications, and weather service. Some of us had bombed Berlin. And now we were trying to keep the same city alive. It meant that we had to get more from each airplane and from each man than ever before. Takeoffs with full loads were three minutes apart. The air corridor to the wind was narrow and dangerous. With 40 to 50 airplanes going through it simultaneously, they had to be accurately spaced. And until the late stages of the airlift, they were flown at five different levels, the levels being 500 feet apart. This called for extremely precise air traffic control. Here, the position of each aircraft in the constant stream of C-54s was plotted and replotted. And every three minutes, there was a landing at Tempelhof, the Berlin Air Terminus. Each aircraft in Operation Vittles flew three round trips every day to Tempelhof or to the other airfields in the Allied sector. At the end of the line, volunteer crews of displaced persons were always on hand to unload our aircraft, and it took an army of them. At the height of the airlift, the control tower at Tempelhof handled more than 400 landings and takeoffs every day, seven days a week, around the clock, and regardless of weather. Operation Vittles really gave us, in 15 months, as much experience in air transport as we ordinarily get in 10 years. When bad weather arrived in the fall, everyone was put to the supreme test. Rain and heavy fog day after day. The communists expected the airlift would be broken, but it wasn't. We kept right on. Army Airways communication system operated a network that fed information to ground control approach at Tempelhof. Rotating GCA antennae tied air and ground together. GCA operators, at radar scopes 24 hours a day, talked us down at the rate of a landing every three minutes. Baker George II, uh, this is the final controller. Uh, remain on receive for the remainder of this transmission. Uh, maintain your present elevation and continue vector 315. You're almost at the glide path. Uh, begin your rate of descent at 500 feet per minute. We're starting down the glide path. A rate of descent is good. Azimuth is good. Elevation good. Very 
nice flying indeed. Maintain your heading on course, on the glide pad. Very good. Now over the end of the runway. Azimuth and elevation both perfect. Touchdown in four seconds. Take it over, Baker George Two. It's all yours from here. At first we used a good many C 47s. But for an operation on this scale, they were too small and too slow. So the C-54s took over. We soon began setting records, and then we broke them as fast as we made them. Coal was vitally important. We had to fly it in if there was going to be any heat or light or power in West Berlin. The coal came from the Ruhr and was sacked in war surplus duffel bags. We saw to it that every pound was put to good use. Berlin was saved because the airlift kept the fires burning, kept wheels turning, kept the ovens going. Not long before, we had been delivering bombs to compel peace. Now we were delivering bread to maintain that peace. The airlift cargoes kept the city alive. Before Operation Vittles, Berlin was one of the places where children cringed in terror at the roar of airplanes overhead. The airlift planes taught them they need cringe no more. In 15 months, the airlift brought in two and a quarter million tons of supplies, life-sustaining necessities, the greatest feat in transportation history, achieved by the RAF, the United States Army, Navy, and Air Force. Meanwhile, in this building at Fort Worth, Texas, another great Air Force achievement of a different kind was taking shape. The B-36, the first genuine intercontinental bomber. No aircraft had ever had a wing spread like this, 230 feet. That's equal to a distance from home plate in Yankee Stadium to a point over 100 feet beyond the second base. No bomber ever had such tremendous fuselage space. From nose to tail and from wall to wall, the equal of 10 good-sized living rooms. The B-36 was first conceived in 1941, and by 1946, she was ready for her first test flight. Big, wasn't she? Her main function was to carry bombs but she went up well armed with eight gun turrets, each mounting two 20 millimeter cannon that could fire explosive shells as well as armor piercing projectiles. That was more and better armament than any other bomber ever had. Being one of the most complicated engines of war ever built, the B-36 needed a crew of 16 specialists. Every one of them was a man of great experience and skill and they worked together for long periods and achieved a high degree of teamwork. It was an honor to be picked as a member of a B-36 crew, and the men who flew the big bomber came to admire her. Talk about power. In the late stages of development, the B-36 had six piston engines of 3,800 horsepower each and four jet engines each capable of 5,200 pounds of thrust at takeoff. The big bomber had a much greater carrying capacity than any other aircraft so far produced. There was room in the four big bomb bays for 100 500-pound bombs, or when tremendously big ones were needed, the cargo could be two bombs, each weighing 21 tons. load of 21,000 gallons, the B-36 had tremendous range, 
10,000 miles without refueling and a combat radius of more than 4,000 miles. Even at great altitudes and at more than 400 miles an hour, the B-36 was a steady flying platform, a stable and accurate bomber. Over the target. With its speed, armament, and high altitude capability, the B-36 became the Strategic Air Command's Sunday punt. It gave the Air Force one of its best means of winning friends and influencing people. Largely because of this aircraft, the Strategic Air Command was the first military organization in history that could assault the heart of a remote enemy country from stateside bases within hours after the outbreak of a war. The 36 proved to be a great airplane, and there was no question as to where it belonged. Right where it was, in the United States Air Force.